I'll begin by saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I think we're all used to uh, saying all of those at the same time uh, these days, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, webinar for speakers and presiding officers on COVID-19 and independent parliaments. Uh, my name is James Pinnell. I'm the Programmes Manager at the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, primarily responsible for multilateral engagements, uh, and I'll be moderating this online seminar. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by a very esteemed panel of speakers and presiding officers from across the Commonwealth, uh, including uh, the Honourable Mohammed Nasheed, Speaker of the People's Majlis of the Maldives, uh, Honourable Kate Dowst, President of the Legislative Council of Western Australia, uh, the Honourable Hitendra Nath Goswami, Speaker of the Assam Legislative Assembly, and as I say, hopefully sooner rather than later, the Honourable Mickey Rattle, uh, Speaker of the Parliament of the Cook Islands and Chair of CPA Small Branches Network. Uh, we're also very fortunate to be hearing from Mr. Matthew Salek, Head of Parliamentary Development at the CPA Secretariat and author of the Model Law for Independent Parliaments, uh, which we will be covering during our discussions today. Uh, you will also be hearing from uh, our CPA Secretary General, Mr. Stephen Twigg, uh, following the conclusion of this webinar, uh, and our sincere thanks to Stephen for his kind attendance. Uh, I also think it's appropriate, I don't know if he's managed to join us uh, just yet, uh, but I would like to acknowledge uh, the uh, attendance of the Honourable John Jacker, President of the New South Wales Legislative Council and also Vice Chairperson of the CPA. And we are very pleased to hopefully be having uh, Honourable Jacker join us today. Uh, more broadly, uh, I'd like to say how delighted the CPA is to be hosting this programme, uh, specifically aimed at speakers from across the Commonwealth. Uh, presiding officers are one of our key stakeholders and partners in delivering on our commitments to identifying benchmarks of good governance uh, and promoting parliamentary practice and procedure. Uh, it's not often that we are able to convene such a gathering, uh, and even when we do try, uh, technical issues do do crop up. Um, so such a gathering uh, like we have today is, is a very special occasion uh, and one which we are actually hoping to replicate at another speaker's webinar in the near future uh, for those CPA regions um, who, who aren't with us uh, today. Uh, the CPA is also looking to deliver capacity building presiding officers of the Commonwealth through the delivery of the Parliamentary Academy, uh, which will include a course for speakers. Um, the Parliamentary Academy is an online learning resource uh, dedicated to our membership to provide capacity building uh, and information on the various roles in, in Parliament. And we'll, of course, keep all branches updated on the progress uh, in, in delivering these courses and the delivery of the Parliamentary Academy. Uh, again, I'm conscious of time and, and the need to um, jump on my emails to try and make sure that everyone uh, who is hoping to join us is able to join us. Um, so I just have a few housekeeping points. Um, I just wish to remind all speakers and attendees that this webinar is being recorded, uh, but it is not being live streamed. Um, should anyone wish to request that part of this webinar is not included in the final recording, uh, please do let us know and advise accordingly and we, we will do what we can. Um, all attendees, if I could ask you to uh, mute uh, your microphones if you're not speaking just to avoid any background noise um, and please do feel free to use uh, the chat functions. Uh, if you need to, uh, or should you want to, it's what it's there for. Uh, feel free to discuss amongst yourselves. Uh, also, please feel free to use the chat function uh, to send through any questions you may have uh, for the Q&A session, which will follow uh, the presentations from our speakers. Um, please feel free to do that, but also we will, ex we will have um, oral, oral questions uh, should anyone wish to, to ask them uh, directly. That's also absolutely fine. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite our first panellist to speak, uh, Mr. Matthew Salek. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I'm going to uh, start my presentation, but I will try and be as brief uh, as possible um, because we're conscious of running over time. Um, I'm very privileged to be on a panel with so many uh, speakers and presiding officers. Um, so uh, I'm speaking about the, uh, the CPA model law, the independent parliaments, which the CPA published um, back in uh, May of 2020. Um, and the model law uh, was designed to uh, enable parliaments who haven't already done so or who wish to look at reforming uh, their parliamentary service commissions and the creation of a corporate body uh, in terms of parliament. Basically, it's a guide to enable parliamentarians to create corporate bodies and to have the powers and structures in place to function effectively and specifically to ensure parliaments have the administrative, operational, financial resources uh, to be able to adapt and function uh, in instances such as uh, the COVID crisis. 
Um, it's also important to enable parliaments to ensure there is an adequate leadership uh, from across the parliament um, and specifically the role of the speaker within such a body. Um, it, model law looks very much at what the rationale is for parliaments, but also what the rationale is for governments to create such an entity and to look at giving more independence to parliament. It provides a roadmap uh, that the parliament could seek to uh, to follow in terms of implementing such uh, changes. And it's intended to be adaptive for different styles of uh, Westminster systems and um, for bicameral or unicameral parliaments uh, for small branches, larger branches. Um, but also um, because it is designed as a model law, as a template piece of legislation to create a parliamentary service commission, um, it enables parliaments, if there is no government uh, political will, to push for that change through private legislation. Um, the reasons for publishing it, well, it's because it, according to the Sustainable Development Goals, it's very important in terms of SDG 16 and 17 that institutions such as parliaments are strong and effective institutions. Uh, it also meets the requirements in terms of the Latimer House principles and the Commonwealth Charter in terms of the separation of powers to ensure that parliaments are more independent from the executive and the judiciary. Uh, the Zambia recommendations, which were developed in 2005, which highlight the recommendations for the financing and administration of parliaments. And more recently, which I'm sure most people are aware of, the CP benchmarks for democratic legislatures, which is a set of standards, which minimum standards that parliaments across the Commonwealth should aim to meet. But it's very much um, precipitated around the outcomes of the benchmark reports that we have so far undertaken with around about 13 parliaments across the Commonwealth. And many of those reports and the, the outcomes of those self-assessments have highlighted that there are clearly deficiencies almost universally in terms of parliaments either having adequate financial autonomy or administrative autonomy. Um, but I guess one of the most important reasons for us developing this model law uh, was because of COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 has highlighted the need for parliaments to be independent, autonomous and well-resourced institutions if they're able to continue to function in the situation that COVID has created. Um, the model law also uh, coincides with the publishing of a CPA's COVID-19 toolkit for Commonwealth parliaments. Um, and in this toolkit, we talked about um, how parliaments can remain operational or functional and a safe environment for staff and members. Um, and so, both toolkits work in tandem, both in what to do and what needs to be done institutionally to ensure it's uh, possible. Um, but if parliaments are not, uh, in relation to COVID, if parliaments are not independent enough, don't have enough resources, finances, um, aren't able to determine itself um, and how it wishes to be governed, then there can be a number of problems that have and are uh, affecting money parliaments due to COVID. Uh, for one thing, there is at times a leadership vacuum in a number of jurisdictions. Speakers have felt reluctant to take uh, steps to adapt the parliament and to initiate those changes because they don't feel they have the power or authority to do so. In smaller jurisdictions where they rely very heavily on standing orders and precedent, um, if it's silent and there is no emergency capacity, if there's no flexibility in, in the administrative control from the speaker, then they are unable to adapt to parliament effectively. And if the government is too busy to try and mitigate the issues of COVID um, and may be less inclined to ensure Parliament is effectively scrutinising the government's policy on COVID, then again, it can disincentivise uh, the necessary requirements and again, create a, a leadership vacuum. Um, and also, if the opposition is not in agreement with what the speaker may want to do, again, that creates a, uh, an issue in terms of affecting a, a more cross-party, a cross, party, cross uh, a bilateral sort of approach to mitigating those changes. Um, if Parliament doesn't have necessary financial autonomy, how is it going to get the necessary finances to uh, implement the necessary IT and software uh, investment and infrastructure to um, have a hybrid or virtual parliament, it might struggle to do that. And so having financial autonomy is, is a key element that is highlighted in the benchmarks and also in the, the model law. Um, staffing and duty of care. In many jurisdictions, staff are employed by the government and not the parliament. Um, the model law encourages um, parliament to be the employer of its own staff. Um, 
So if there's a conflict of interest, as in the case of the UK, if the UK government wanted member um, staff to go back to work, but uh, you know, and, and in Westminster, lots of staff had to return to Whitehall to continue functioning. But because the UK Parliament has its own staff, it could differ in terms of that policy. And also, there's an important element in of duty of care. If steps aren't taken adequately to safeguard uh, members and staff's health and safety, then as in the case of Bahamas, you have a situation where 10% of members have contracted COVID because steps weren't taken quickly enough to be able to mitigate that issue. And also in the case of subnational jurisdictions, if there isn't effective clarity in how the parliament is being operationally and financially and administratively run, then the, the subnational legislature could get caught between federal government's approach, the subnational government's approach, and the federal parliament's approach, uh, which can create a great deal of confusion when you really want to have as much clarity as possible. And um, I guess COVID, what it does is it basically shines a spotlight on what are everyday institutional weaknesses in the administrational function of parliaments. And so it's very important that parliaments can be uh, strong and independent and effectively be able to run themselves and be adaptive to issues such as COVID and potential future issues that might come up. And if you haven't already, I would highly encourage um, you to read the model law and to take a, a, an honest look at how your parliament is being administered and financed and then try and seek to make the necessary changes as possible uh, to overcome issues like COVID for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt, for your for your presentation. And uh, I believe all all attendees should have been forwarded a copy of the model law uh, in advance of this of this session. Uh, I hope everyone's had a chance uh, to look at it. Um, but if not, I, I hope that uh, Matt's explanation of what it aims aims to do encourages everyone to read it and ideally make use of it uh, where necessary. Uh, I believe we are still waiting for the honourable speaker Nikki Rattle from from the Cook Islands uh, to join us. So it may be that. Uh, it may be prudent to to shake up the, the, the speaking order a little bit. Uh, so if I could invite the Honourable Kate Dares, President of the Legislative Council of Western Australia, uh, to speak next. Uh, you have the microphone, Honourable Dares. Thanks for that, James, and good afternoon to everyone um, from Perth, uh, from the Legislative Council uh, of Western Australia. Look, thanks very much. Um, we're still like everyone else uh, coming out of COVID, we uh, still have our state boundaries locked down and uh, our parliament has been functioning uh, certainly in a very different way to what most members have, well, all members have been used to. And so I, I pro probably can only speak on behalf of the Legislative Assembly. Um, we, both, both chambers, but particularly uh, looking at the council, have put in place a range of different mechanisms to uh, continue functioning during the COVID period and so have made changes to seating arrangements, to the floor space of the chamber, have uh, prevented access to the building from the public, uh, and even now have only just started to um, limit access in the last few weeks with restricted numbers into the building. We've put in additional uh, sanitation, um, access uh, and, and provided additional cleaning in the building. Uh, we've uh, changed the way we manage divisions, um, question time, uh, movement of staff on the floor of the house. Um, we've had additional sitting times to deal with uh, COVID specific legislation. So we've actually had callback um, for the house to sit extra days and hours um, to do. And I think since April we've had at least 20 specific COVID related uh, pieces of legislation passed through both houses. Um, so added added to the burden for staff and for members in terms of um, additional sitting days. Uh, we've had to, um, for those, for some staff members, um, people were able to work from home. Our committees have con continued to function. People have had to um, learn to deal with Zoom or Teams in some case, in terms of how they've connected uh, with uh, members of the public or departments providing submissions or for, for hearings. Uh, each committee has determined its own procedures um, in terms of how they've managed public or private or who had access uh, to those hearings. Committees have, have completed tasks and have provided uh, reports. So in terms of our workload, we've tried to keep uh, working through legislation and committee inquiries 
And uh, for some members, I think it's particularly given the size of our state and the remote location some of our members come from, it's been a challenge in terms of access via the net uh, to be able to engage, but most people seem to have managed. We were able to negotiate with the government to provide additional IT supports um, with uh, provide, so that members could either work remotely uh, from their elected offices or enable their staff to do so. So we were able to negotiate an additional laptop uh, for each MP's office and to uh, enable uh, access to their uh, files uh, that would normally be kept on the server uh, to enable them to get on and do their job uh, depending upon the arrangements they put in for each of their own offices. Uh, and that seemed to have worked quite well over, over the last few months. Um, a number of members elected to um, close access to their electorate offices but continued working behind the doors and some, depending upon their own health arrangements or that of their staff, may have opted to have worked from home. Uh, in terms of the parliament, uh, a, a number of different types of arrangements were put in place where some staff, uh, I think there was a rotation in some areas where some staff worked from home, some staff worked from the building, um, but, but work continued on. And I know that uh, certainly uh, COVID has proved uh, interesting in relation to additional costs uh, and, and there was substantial uh, additional costs in relation to additional technology, uh, both hardware and software, and, and obviously additional cleaning and provision of, of um, hygiene um, products around the building. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's something that hasn't been factored in before. We are gradually coming out of those arrangements and it's hoped in the next few weeks that we might be able to resume some sort of normal seating arrangements in the chamber currently in the upper house uh, of our 35 members on the floor, 36 in total, uh, only the party leaders, and we have eight separate parties in the upper house, only those eight leaders and the two whips uh, were given designated seats. All other members in the upper house either found a non-designated seat or sat in the president's gallery and would seek the call from wherever they happened to be. And if they uh, wanted to speak, they would speak at a podium so, and questions, um, rather than individual members asking questions, uh, the party leaders would, in the, on the whole, would ask questions on behalf of their members. Um, and uh, it's been an interesting challenge in terms of time management uh, to, to deal with all of those things in the chamber, but we seem to have managed. And so hopefully in the next couple of weeks, uh, on advice from the uh, public, uh, from the chief health officer, uh, and negotiating with each of the parties, we're hoping to resume uh, normal seating arrangements and some sort of return to um, our normal standing orders in relation to questions and um, and other practices in the chamber. So, um, but we are still restricting access to the public gallery uh, for the next few weeks before we finish our sitting time. Uh, having looked at the model law that Matthew's referred to, whilst we don't actually have uh, formal uh, legislative arrangements in place that deal with the issues canvassed in that document. We have, I suppose, uh, have custom and practice uh, where a lot of those things are actually happening. Uh, we are reliant on, on the government of the day to uh, sign off on a budgetary allocation, and we are certainly accountable for that. We have had to seek additional funds, certainly in the upper house, to provide for um, extra full-time staff, uh, on our, certainly in our committee rooms, uh, to uh, deal with additional inquiries that we've had because of the, um, uh, the increase of independent parties, you might say. Uh, so whilst the government had agreed to that, uh, the COVID arrangements um, weren't factored in at that point in time. But I think that given we've, we've had to adapt and people are becoming more reliant on the use of technology in their day-to-day -day work, both in the parliament and uh, in their elected offices, I think that there will probably need to be uh, further discussions with the government about how we manage these circumstances in the event that it might happen again. Uh, and certainly, uh, that's, I think that's been a challenge, uh, not just for our parliament, but for certainly other parliaments. Um, it was very important for us as a state parliament to remain functioning in terms of how the public perceived what we were doing. And, and to, to be able to address uh, issues that arose uh, that were quite unusual in COVID 
and, and hence the 20 pieces of legislation that we pushed through that dealt with issues around um, residential and commercial tenancies, payroll tax issues, health issues, um, matters relating to um, accommodation payments for people returning to our state, both from overseas and interstate. Uh, so it was it was quite complicated. But and, and so what we've done there is, again, in exceptional circumstances, have uh, all the parties agreed to suspend standing orders and to deal with COVID-related bills in, a, in a, um, a very specific manner and to deal with all stages in one day. So it's been um, very interesting to see that the parties were prepared to put aside their normal um, political stances that they may have taken on certain elements of those bills, the fact that quite often they weren't being briefed in due, with appropriate time, hadn't had time to consider the, the detail of a lot of the bills, hadn't had time to consult with stakeholders. Um, quite often they were being, you know, bills were being brought in, uh, I think we dealt with a good half dozen over two or three days at one point. So people certainly stepped up to the plate, acknowledged the difficulty of the time and, and dealt with the legislation to enable those changes. Uh, a lot of those uh, pieces of legislation will, um, ha, you know, have a, will fall away in due course. Uh, one has just been extended in relation to payroll to take it through to uh, 2021. Um, so it, it's a bit of an evolving beast, if you like, to see how we manage um, some of these changes, uh, given we don't know when and if um, this COVID period will actually cease. So it's it's been a very challenging time, but I think um, people have certainly um, risen to the to the um, cause. In terms of the parliament, uh, we certainly have a range of structures in place uh, to deal with the issues. We established a crisis management team across both houses and parliamentary services. We have the management executive team made up of the speaker, the president, the uh, head of our parliamentary services and our two clerks, which meets uh, on a regular basis. We have our joint standing committee for parliamentary services, uh, which meets once every couple of months. And so we've been able to provide them with information. Certainly there was uh, substantial communication provided via email to all staff, um, both within the building and certainly uh, through members and their electorate staff um, as required as well to keep them up to date with any any changes that were happening in the building. Um, during the actual COVID period, pretty much from April through to about August, access to the parliament was restricted to members and staff that needed to be here. Um, and since August, that's gradually being eased off. Um, and it's hoped that um, next year that we'll be in a much better uh, position. Uh, and we're probably in a better place than most, um, fortunately, in terms of our numbers. So, um, you know, we're looking forward to, to change. Um, and I, I think that's uh, probably about all I can say on that at the moment. I mean, um, I, I think given our isolation, um, we've, we've been able to um, manage these issues quite well. And certainly um, the, the fact that we've we've uh, been able to um, address uh, COVID specific issues in a timely fashion, and uh, and in a you know a considered way, I think has been an interesting learning curve, um, and and certainly the fact that our committees were able to continue functioning and provide very detailed uh, and um, appropriate reports during this time has been very good. And I think some of the takeouts for us has been about how we could better utilise technology uh, in our work uh, and in, in our communication, not just with our members, but certainly with the broader community. So I think there's some really good uh, learning outcomes for us uh, in terms of how we manage our work. Many thanks, Honourable Dast, um, for, your, for your contributions. And certainly you can understand uh, challenges of time management that you had to deal with uh, and absolutely challenges of the size of Western Australia. I can imagine that that that, that was also a challenge, um, but, but but also glad to hear that there, there's some positives coming out of it, uh, if we can call them positives, the idea of putting aside <laughs> political biases in the interest of, of passing legislation and sort of lessons learnt. Uh, and I certainly, I think we all hope that you'll be able to return to the normal standing orders uh, very, very soon. Um, so, so thank you again, Honourable Dowst. Uh, if I could next invite Honourable Hitendra Nath Goswami, a Speaker of the Assam Legislative Assembly, uh, to give his remarks. Uh, Honourable Speaker, you have the uh, microphone. Uh, 
Oh, I think you may be muted, Honourable Speaker. Hello, are you hearing? We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, friends, all of us are aware that the COVID-19 pandemic has created havoc in countries across the world, forcing all the countries to resort to total lockdown. The nationwide lockdown and the spread of the COVID-19 in various parts of the world have put immense pressures on the government, the polity, the healthcare system, and the economy, warranting global sharing of knowledge and information about the disease and exchange of essential elements to combat the pandemic. Parliaments across the world have been posed with challenges in their functioning in the wake of pandemic, and they have been equally taking necessary adjustments and adaptations as per the need of the circumstances. It has been reported that in many countries, parliament have literally ceased to function because of the pandemic. Such a situation has definitely prevented the elected representative of the people of those countries to contribute towards the government effort to tackle the grave situation arising out of the pandemic. Parliament has a very crucial and central role in the Indian system of governance. The most important role of parliament is that it checks and challenges the government in office by way of discussing and criticizing it. Such constructive criticism helps the government to function better by way of rectifying its mistakes. Over the decades, Indian parliament has evolved certain procedures of accountability including hearing of committees. I must admit that the current unprecedented situation has compelled the Indian parliament and state assemblies, including my state Assam, to curtail the working days for of its sessions. It is a fact that such curtailment has reduced the scope of elected representative to scrutinize the actions of the government. However, I'm happy to inform you that by extending the working hours, the Lok Sabha, that is the lower house, of Indian Parliament has transacted business 17 hours more than the scheduled hours fixed for the session. As far as the Assam State Legislative Assembly is concerned, in spite of the fact that a good number of Assembly MLAs and Secretary staff, including some ministers, testing COVID positive, we successfully hold a monsoon session for a short period of four days, observing all standard COVID-19 protocol with presence of 50% of members at a given time in order to maintain social distancing norms. Before holding the session, entire assembly compass, including members whose steps were fully sanitized, antigen test was made mandatory for all the honorable members, officers, and staff of the assembly secretary. Thermal scanning was made compulsory in all the entry points and restrictions were imposed regarding presence of officers and press person, and no visitors has been allowed in the visitors gallery during the session. Considering the numbers of government bills table, I, with the approval of business advisory committee, have extended one day of the session and entire eight hours of eight hours of the day was devoted for consideration and passing of bills in and in the process, we are successful to clear 23 numbers of government bills, both new and amendment bill on that day. Members across the party line were allowed to discuss and debate on the bills in details. Several amendments moved by the opposition bench were accepted by the minister in charge, and I have received full cooperation of both opposition and ruling members during the passing of these 23 numbers of bills. Here, I would also like to inform you that in April 2020, Honorable Speaker of Lok Sabha, that is the lower house of parliament, hold a video conference, conference with all the presiding officers of state assemblies to discuss in detail the COVID-19 situation in different parts of India and role of speaker and assembly secretary in helping the distressed people during the period of lockdown. He has also asked the speaker of state assemblies to explore the feasibility of extensive use of in all assembly works for smooth functioning of the assembly in such situation in future. After the video conference, a COVID control room Greed was set up in the parliament as well as 23 state legislature to coordinate the effort of parliaments and state assemblies for relief and rehabilitation of affected people. The control room of Assam State Legislative Assembly has helped about 3,000 people of our state stranding boats inside and outside of India to come back to our state. Similarly, we also helped 
2,720 persons, including migrant laborers, to reach their homes from Assam, situated in different states of India. Besides, all the members of my assembly has agreed to donate one month's salary for relief work, and they have agreed to the request of the state government for 30% pay cut of one month of monthly salary from May 2020 to meet the exigencies arising out of the epidemic, and it is still continuing. It is a matter of great satisfaction that the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Secretary has conducted a study amongst its member countries and has come out with a forward-looking CPA toolkit for Commonwealth parliaments and legislatures on the COVID-19 pandemic and delivering democracy. Adopted by both parliaments and parliamentarians in order to continue to deliver on the legislation role of legislation and delivering democracy during a global pandemic. This toolkit really helps a lot. To sum up, I would like to state to you that for democracy to be meaningful, its institutions have to adapt to the changing needs of time. The pandemic has emphasized the need for developing digital infrastructure and virtual parliaments across the world. To this end, resource and fresh protocols are to be devised to enable parliament to discharge its core functions smoothly. The parliament and state assemblies of India has equally awakened to the needs of the pandemic times and has started addressing and fulfilling them, fulfilling them effectively and efficiently. Friends, it is a fact that most of the parliament across the globe do not enjoy financial and other independence as has been desired. However, all of you definitely agree that parliament cannot remain unequal to their other two counterparts for a greater interest of democracy. I think many parliaments run the risk of losing the faith of faith or trust of the people because of the absence of greater financial and administrative autonomy that the other two pillars of democracy enjoy. This has become very evident during the current crisis precipitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Fortunately, my assembly as well as Indian parliament have full autonomy on both financial and administrative matter. The executive always respect the budget proposal followed by the assembly budget committee headed by the speaker. Uh, Honorable uh, Speaker, you have one minute uh, remaining. Uh, I am concluding now. I, we all know that democracy is of the people, by the people, and for the people. Unless the people of the province do not desire to elect talented and efficient person to the parliament, then should executive always will take maximum chance to prevail over the parliamentarians. To avert such a situation, speaker must play a pivotal role as a guardian of parliamentary democracy, democratic system. And, I, and finally, as far as model law for independent parliaments are concerned, we have distributed to the all leaders of our group, of all legislative groups, and we'll have definitely take a final call after meeting on our meeting of the entire committee. Thank you. Thank you all. Many thanks, Honourable Speaker, for your, for your contributions, and, and many thanks also for distributing the model law uh, amongst your members. And, and I think it's also right that you started um, your contributions by highlighting the key role of scrutineer, uh, the parliamentary, the parliament's role as a scrutineer and agent of accountability. Um, so thank you so, so much, Honourable Speaker, for your, for your contributions. Uh, I'll now move to the Honourable Mohammed Nasheed, Speaker of the People's Majlis of the Maldives. Uh, it's a very, it's a very great pleasure to have you with us, uh, Honourable Speaker, especially as one of the uh, newest members of the Commonwealth family. Uh, the microphone is now yours. Well, um, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure um, to be joining um, all my colleagues um, through the webinar. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Yes, the Maldives has been away from the fold for some while uh, during the last four or five years from the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Uh, that we are back again, uh, and we hope to uh, take part in full in affairs of the Commonwealth uh, Parliamentary Association. Today, uh, you know, after the COVID and all during this pandemic, we are trying to examine the nature of parliaments as independent institutions, especially in the context of COVID-19. Those who wanted to suppress the parliaments had a very dangerous rhetoric. They, they brought on public health officials to their side. 
and kept on continuously arguing that it was in the best interest of public health for us to um, stay at home. Now, when people come out and talk about public health um, and the need to be careful, it's difficult for elected officials to counter that. So I think there was a, it was very, very difficult for us to overcome this difficulty where the rhetoric was coming from public health officials. Uh, our constitution, but uh, in spite of everything, in spite of everything, we were the first parliament in the in the world uh, to start having visual virtual sessions. We started, we had our first session on 30th of March. Uh, we did two bills, 16 reports, three early day motions, one consent for a minister and four others. And also we had 123 committee sittings during uh, the lockdown. So we were able to, in a sense, work reasonably. Uh, our constitution allow us to be independent. The constitution of the Maldives was amended in 2008, and we are very fortunate uh, to have a progressive constitution that has allowed us in, on the main since 2008 up until 2012 to, to function as a normal parliament. But then again, uh, we, we were unfortunate, we slipped, we had a coup, uh, the parliament was suppressed up until very recently in 2018. Our constitution still, during during these last six, five, four, five years, it still, our constitution still uh, maintained um, the independence of the parliament. And it also gives us uh, the ability to come up with uh, rules of procedures, standing orders, parliament to function independently. It would also give its limits and it, it powers. Presently, right now, we are very fortunate. We won the 2008 elections uh, and subsequently the parliamentary elections uh, where we won a two-thirds majority. And therefore, the independence of the parliament at this moment in time is fairly secure. So the question that we keep on asking, therefore now, and especially with our Commonwealth friends, is how, A, how did we do it? How did we slip? A, first, after 30 years of dictatorial rule, single party rule, in 2008, we were able to galvanize our public to political activism. We were able to come up with uh, a new constitution. We were able to have our first multi-party elections. And I was fortunate to have won those elections in 2008. But, okay, so our first question is, how how do you do it? How do you come to an independent institution? How do you get the parliament to be born? Uh, secondly, our question now is, uh, how do we sustain that? Can Is it possible for us to keep going as we are now? I feel that there are some uh, basic fundamentals that we have to take on board. This I say this knowing that the vast majority of Commonwealth parliaments are not independent. I say this knowing that the vast majority of governance in Commonwealth countries are, are literally, practically dictatorships. Yes, of course, we have India. Of course, we have Australia, England, Canada, uh, and many other countries, uh, New Zealand, many, many, many other countries uh, who, are, who are, you know, exemplary democratic societies, and especially the Maldives is very fortunate to have India right next to it and therefore continuously being able to be lessened and also understood, knowing on how they conduct their democracy there. Um, so I, I say this knowing that the parliament, I feel, must be useful not only for the government but for the opposition. Uh, we now have come into power with two-thirds majority, and it would be so simple for us to suppress them now. We, or in a parliament of 87, I, we do not have even uh, 12, uh, a dozen opposition MPs now. So my view is, if we are to sustain this, 
we have to make sure that we give them enough space, we give them enough time, and we recognize them as the opposition. Usually, you would be doing, doing these recognitions through legislations and, if possible, through constitutional amendments as well. I also think that we have to have frequent sessions whenever we can. Keep on meeting. Make sure that the parliament becomes a feature of life in society. Say that it is broadcasted, it is available for everyone to see, that it is there every day, nine in the morning. People can tune in and people know that it's going to be sitting. I think frequent sessions are very, very important. We must make parliaments relevant, COVID or not. We cannot sustain uh, independence of parliaments if they are totally irrelevant. So we should be debating issues of the day. We, we also must make sure that there is debate. How the speaker and the, uh, the secretariat uh, and the clerks, how can we assist uh, the, the, the MPs to conduct a proper debate uh, and to come up with proposals, resolutions, and, and then vote upon it, raising a debate to a decision and making and seeing that the member of parliaments make that decision. So I think it's very, very important that we are able to present a lively debate. You know, in a sense, nine o'clock in the morning, everyone is tuning in. You don't want to be extremely boring. You don't want to be as boring as the weather. So, you know, basically, please entertain your public. Let them know that this is a lively thing to watch. Debate times. It has to be on prime time and it has to fall to prime time. So I think, uh, uh, well, we are standing orders and all that is there, but debate topic, debate time. And I also think most, most importantly, awareness of the MPs. Uh, uh, very often members of parliament are politicians. They are very good politicians. They are in touch with their people. They know the pulse of the people. They know the pulse of the society. But very often they are not very academic in, in some instances and maybe perhaps not that organized or administrative either. But that's why we have a parliamentary service uh, to assist the MPs in doing whatever the MP wants done, drafting bills, drafting amendments, uh, uh, drafting interventions, make sure that the MP is fed enough with material. Uh, I think talking points and that kind of thing to be done through House majority leaders and minority leaders. I will speak to you I, have one minute remaining. Okay, international collaboration to protect parliaments. In 2017, our parliament was occupied by our military and it remained like that up until 2018, late 2018. Uh, I propose that the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association establish office of the joint sergeant at arms that would intervene in countries disputes and try to see how the commonwealth parliamentary association can resolve that we were a common a commonwealth parliamentary association member and the military occupied our parliament and, and you know next time i would like the commonwealth to be in it at it and as an organization try and see how we may be able to resolve it Expulsion from the Commonwealth is not very interesting. It's it's very often it's it's in the interest of the dictatorship to get you out of it. So continuous talking uh, and and negotiations with dictatorships are, I think, all very necessary. Well, again, thank you very much for uh, coming up with the webinar. Um, in these things, you always tend to mess up things as we did today, but I am sure. Uh, we would be able to um, have an excellent uh, workshop today. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Honourable Speaker, for that very, 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 very interesting um, discussion uh, and also for highlighting the, the, the dangerous rhetoric that we've seen uh, from those wishing to, to suppress parliaments and, and absolutely agree we need to do everything we can uh, to counteract that. Um, unfortunately, we still don't have um, Madam Speaker uh, Nikki Rattle from the Cook Islands. I understand it's very late. Uh, her time and, and with the uh, previous technical difficulties and technical issues 
uh, we do understand if, that, that, that there are, are good reasons that she's not able to join us. Um, so in the interest of time, I think it'd be, it'd be prudent for us to move on to the Q&A session of, of this webinar. Uh, so I'd now like to open the floor uh, to anybody wishing, wishing to ask a question based on what they've heard, um, what, what they maybe thought uh, wasn't mentioned. Um, so I'd now like to invite anybody who has any questions. Uh, if they would like to use that, they, they should have a raise hand function on their screens should they wish to, to ask a question. Um, so I'd now like to open the floor uh, to questions. Do we have any questions? In that case, maybe I can I can start by um, asking a question uh, myself, and it, it really does come off the back of uh, the point made by the honourable speaker from from the Maldives about that dangerous rhetoric of those wishing to to suppress parliaments. Uh, I think it's something that's that's definitely uh, been seen not not just during. Uh, COVID, I, I think for for a couple of years now we've seen um, this, this this populist rhetoric, a uh, bit of executive um, sort of grab. Um, so in, if if we use COVID as an opportunity to explore that uh, in more detail, uh, and this 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 sidelining this the, the danger of sidelining parliaments, um, I wonder if any of the speakers would like to talk about how they feel uh, are the best ways to counter. Um, rhetoric around sidelining parliaments in times of crises like this. How do uh, you think of the best ways that parliament can remain relevant? Uh, I was speaker from the Maldives, uh, Mohammed Nasheed. Uh, I think you, you covered it quite well, but I'd also be very interested about hearing from the others. So if we could go back to uh, Honourable Doust in Western Australia first. Thanks for that, James. Um, look, I suppose um, our experience is, is significantly different um, from that of uh, the Maldives and others. Um, certainly, um, the idea that we continue to function during the COVID period was indeed very important, not just in terms of how members of the public um, perceived their local member to continue working, but obviously um, the government had, uh, as, you know, trying to deal with an emergency. Um, it, it was important that we function to enable legislation to go through. So I think we had a reasonably positive experience. I mean, some of the adjustments we had to make um, probably went against our normal practice in the upper house uh, in terms of, you know, for the first time uh, that I'm aware of uh, in the last 20 years at least, uh, we actually agreed to gag, to basically gag debate. We, we agreed to limited speaking times, um, on, on COVID-related bills, um, not on our normal bills, but on COVID bills, um, to address the fact that there was an element of emergency um, or urgency to um, proceed with those bills. And so, you know, normally that would be anathema to the members of the upper house to have that put in place, but people um, dealt with that in a fairly sensible way. And, and it only applies to those sort of bills. So that was, you know, that was something that um, that was probably a significant uh, challenge and change for people. And that was that was sort of um, put on the members by the government in terms of being expeditious. Um, but there really hasn't been um, a lot of other interference in terms of our day to day function because you know our parliament is in the fortunate position where our staff are employed directly by the parliament, not by the executive, um, uh, and, and the government was willing to um, provide additional supports to members to enable them to do their work uh, in their electorates as well. So I think, you know, on the whole over this period, we've, we've managed reasonably well, but I acknowledge that for other places it, it um, probably hasn't been um, as you know, as straightforward, if you like. Uh, we probably were in a better position because we had um, a much lower fatality and infection rate than even a lot of our other states. Um, our borders went down fairly quickly, um, so we are able to operate in a different environment um, and, and people adjusted um, fairly well. Um, to those changes, may not have been happy with it, but they they adjusted to it. 
Um, so I think I think we've probably been in a fairly reasonable space in terms of how we've managed uh, the relationship between the parliament and the government. I know that whenever we had, particularly for the upper house, um, whenever we had to um, do anything that was significant in terms of changes to standing orders or other processes, that we had uh, meetings between myself and each of the leaders of the parties in the upper house and basically negotiated our way through those changes and um, and, and sort of communicate those back through the, the other members of the house. So that, I think that became more important to have that very open and frank discussion about how we would work through issues. And hopefully that's something that we can continue doing. Perfect. Thank you so much, okay. Honourable Dest. Uh, if I could pass I on to Honourable Goswami and Assam. Yeah, actually what happened, uh, if you have a democracy to be uh, to be a meaningful one, then the educated and competent people must have interest in the system. What I have seen where the literacy is less, I have seen that the, that the, that the right people, those are competent people, they are very much less interested to come and join this democratic politics by, by becoming an active politician. And as a result, what happened, as I told you earlier also, that a politician must be equivalent in his approach with any other judi any person of judiciary or an executive. But what we get, the quality in the assemblies or in the parliament in most of the countries where educate literacy is maximum. So that's why the, the the democ democracy, as you, as as I have told earlier, so it is for by the people, for the people, of the people. So people, who are the people? If they are really competent, then nobody can force away, force us to leave our place. So that is the important thing. So unless and until we can educate the people, that you, the talented and the best people, should come and join politics and active politics, so that the government, democratic government, can sustain. Otherwise. This will be very difficult to keep, to make uh, to keep our independence independence intact in all the time. That is my view. Many thanks, Honorable Goswami, uh, and I'll pass the question on to uh, Honorable Nasheed as well. I know that you spoke about this during your your contributions, uh, but if there's any further remarks you'd like to make. Well, uh, this time around. Uh, the Maldives were fortunate because it's our government, we are in government, we have our party president, and we, we, we were very, very fortunate. But the opposition and everyone else who was trying to see that the parliament was marginalized, uh, but were using public health arguments to suggest that, uh, you know, we should not sit. Uh, and that, I said, was very difficult. So how we overcome that, how we overcame that was to, we spoke to the public health director general and the public health officials. We, we had a continuous dialogue and engagement with them, and we made sure that we were exemplary in how we conducted ourselves, uh, how, how we were distancing from each other, how we were using masks and, and, and so on. So we were, we were able to adhere to all the public health regulations. And, you know, fortunately, none of the MPs have, uh, 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 none of the MPs are infected yet, fingers crossed. Um, I'm sure one of us are going to go down soon. Uh, but uh, we have really looked after ourselves and the parliamentarians and the staff. And when we started working, uh, what we saw was other branches of government also started working in the same fashion. Uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court of the Maldives have now decided that they will be, uh, they will have, you know, virtual settings all the time even while the court is meeting in person, um, they are now um, going to televise their um, hearings. Uh, similarly, uh, the government also started uh, getting the ministries and the ministers out uh, to, to start working um, through uh, distant means or uh, with the protocol. Now, my point is, there are many, many 
ideas and ways of trying to suppress a parliament. There are many ways of trying to do that. Now, COVID gave another angle to it. So public health. Now, most of the public health legislations, you can prorogue parliament uh, using public health arguments. You can declare health emergencies without the parliament. So this wasn't looking very good. You can actually declare emergency rule without the parliament through the Public Health Act. So I think we need to think about these things and make sure that the representatives of the people actually decide on uh, if we are going to shut down or not. But yes, of course, it's listening to public health officials and we have to do it. Thank you. Many thanks, Honourable Speaker. I'll, I'll open the floor again to to any other any other questions from any other participants or, or, or colleagues. Uh, I don't see any any hands raised. So I'll, I'll just ask one more question, and then and then maybe that'll be the the last one before we move on to uh, closing remarks. Um, I'll just put it to the the, the panelists: What, if anything, were you not able to achieve uh, that you might have been able to do if your Parliament had more independence uh, and autonomy? Uh, quite a big question, I, I, I realise. Uh, so apologies for putting you, putting you on the spot. Um, but if we start with Honourable Goswami this time. Uh, could you repeat that your, your question? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, if anything, were you not able to achieve uh, that you might have been able to do if your parliament had more independence and autonomy? No, uh, as I told you, in uh, my experience in Assam is a bit different. Uh, we enjoy full autonomy. Only thing is that uh, we are getting all financial autonomy, administrative autonomy, never they dictate us, the government in power, the executive never dictate us, even the judiciary, we ne they never dictate us. I am also do doing one thing. I always want to have an annual meeting uh, with four heads, executive head, judicial head, my parliament head, and one of the press, an important editor of the press. We can discuss our issues together. So to have a vibrant democracy. So as you have said, uh, in my case, actually, if you give me a specific, if you give a specific question, I'll be able to answer from my angle. Uh, perfect. Thank, thank you. So I, I think I think that 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 says a lot in itself. Um, so, so it, it, excellent to hear that that your parliament enjoys enjoys full autonomy. That, that we always like to hear that at the at the CPA. Um, I'll move on to our honourable Doust um, for any comments she might have on that question. Mm. Look, in in relation to the the COVID specific issue, um, look, I, I think that we we've, we've done everything that we were required to do we've dealt with you know we've we've made the adjustments we had to to deal with the business before us um, i mean probably one of the issues that we still need to deal with is the matter of whether or not we can do a virtual sitting our constitution currently prevents that and so that's that's something that we are actually looking at how how can we um, amend the constitution or can we do it via standing orders so that you know we don't get caught out in the future, uh, particularly given that um, in in my house in the in the upper house, um, half of our members are country members, remote working members. Uh, so I think that is something that um, is something we've been put in the place of having to think about how would we deal with this, and and a similar situation would happen for our assembly as well. Uh, in relation to uh, the independence of the parliament and and the relationship with the executive. Uh, you know, there are other matters outside of COVID that, you know, we are trying to resolve in terms of establishing a, a specific parliamentary precinct legislation that I know has been uh, on the table for discussion for probably about 50 years. Uh, and we're hoping that at some point, at some point soon, uh, in the next year or so, that we might actually have that in place so that the parliament has more control over its own area. And, you know, we're still... Um, there are ongoing issues around, uh, as you may be aware, around some uh, matters around uh, oversight and uh, and privileged matters that we're currently dealing with here. So, um, and, and the separation of how how government engages with that, uh, as opposed to uh, the parliament having control over its own own uh, business. So, 
there, there are probably outside of COVID, there are probably a couple of matters, quite significant matters that we need to deal with. But in relation to COVID, um, I think that the one outstanding issue is the the virtual uh, the virtual sitting capacity, and obviously um, how we embrace and improve our use of technology, um, both in the chamber and uh, in our electorate offices in relation to our work with constituents. Perfect, many thanks, uh, Honourable Dest. Uh, and I'll pass over uh, finally to Honourable Nasheed. Well, um, thank you, thank you very much. I, I have this proposal to the CPA. Uh, well, I, I, I will mention it and perhaps I should go through normal procedures in trying to lodge this. I think uh, there is a need for the CPA to establish uh, a negotiating uh, 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 an arm that would more robustly negotiate talk to dictatorships, uh, especially through our parliamentarians, uh, two countries that are in stress. Uh, uh, you know, Maldives is fortunate today, uh, but many of many of our smaller, more smaller parliaments, uh, you know, Commonwealth has just you know, four, a handful of countries to talk about uh, in terms of parliaments and democracies. So it must be our job, COVID or not, to see how uh, we can make sure that parliaments are independent from uh, legislate uh, independent from executives. So I again would like to see how we may be able to uh, proceed on this. Uh, well, you know, thank you very much for uh, uh, conducting this. Uh, during the last few weeks, we've seen um, elections in New Zealand uh, and a new speaker in New Zealand. Um, I must add, um, one of the New Zealand um, MPs uh, is a half Maldivian. Ah. Uh, her mother is Maldivian, so we are very, very proud of that. Uh, we've also we also saw elections in Seychelles, uh, where the Seychelles Parliament, the Seychelles people, have suddenly decided to elect a very, very progressive parliament. Uh, so these are uh, you know, good news, uh, uh, and and I'm sure together we will be able to make parliaments more independent and more vibrant. Thank you. Many thanks, Honourable Speaker, and many thanks to all, all speakers for their, for their contributions. Uh, can I make, make a suggestion? Can I make a suggestion? Uh, please go ahead, Honourable Speaker. Actually, what from Maldives, Maldives, what I have, I have understood, that uh, definitely some countries, permanent parliament, commonwealth countries, uh, they have certain uh, fear for a free and for robust democracy for a continue for for a, for a, for a long period. So why we cannot do one thing that out of the 52 or 53 communal countries, the countries which have certain problems, we can take those problems together, and the the strong democracy which we have in the Commonwealth, they can come to their aid. And as he said, the negotiation, that negotiation, uh, uh, how do we make the negotiation? That also can be analyzed. That is my suggestion. Only. Nothing else. Thank you. Many thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, and, and again, thank you to all, all, all speakers and all panelists uh, for their presentations and also for answering uh, both of those questions uh, so wisely and succinctly. Uh, I'll now invite uh, our Secretary General, Mr. Stephen Twigg, to deliver some closing remarks. James, uh, thank you very much uh, indeed, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. If I might start by thanking our three uh, speakers, the Honourable Doust, the Honourable Goswami, and the Honourable Nasheed for their uh, thoughtful contributions to our discussion today, and to bring apologies from Speaker uh, Nikki Rattle, unfortunately, the technological barriers proved too hard. Uh, speaker Rattle is the Speaker of the Cook Islands Parliament and also chairs our Small Branches Network. Also, apologies from our CPA Vice Chair, the Honourable John Ajaka, President of the New South Wales Parliament, and his colleague Jonathan O'Day, who also were not able to join us today, but I said I would convey their best wishes. It strikes me that a number of 
really interesting themes have come out of today's discussion. Let me say, first of all, as a former parliamentarian myself, what struck me from all three contributions is how hard parliaments have been working through this difficult period. Uh, comments about additional sitting days, additional sitting hours, some of the challenges of new ways of working. Linked to that, I think it's remarkable that we've seen such great adaptation uh, in often very quick uh, circumstances across the parliaments represented here today. I was also struck by comments about cross-party working, bipartisanship, the need to come together when there is an emergency, but also the words of caution around the risk that in an emergency, in a public health situation, arguments are used that could further restrict in some jurisdictions, the independence of parliaments and the ability of parliamentarians, therefore, to be effective in scrutiny and oversight, as well as legislation. Clearly, there's a lot arising from this that we need to consider together moving forward. There are some fascinating issues around the modalities. So once this emergency period is over, parliaments may choose to retain some element of the remote uh, working, hybrid ways of working for committees, for example. I think in terms of citizen engagement and making Parliament more interesting, more accessible to citizens, the greater use of technology is important, though we should always be aware of the digital divide and making sure that that doesn't become an unequal access for different sections of our communities. And then I think there's a set of broader lessons, and I think this is really what um, uh, Speaker Goswami and Speaker Nasheed at the end were focusing on broader lessons for the CPA itself. And this is what I want to finish with today, because I think Speaker Nasheed was referring to this. We've recently issued a consultation paper about the next strategic plan for the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. And I am really keen to engage as many parliamentarians, parliaments, speakers, CPA branches, as well as external organisations in this plan. What can we learn, in particular from 2020, and the experience that we've heard about today as we move forward? How can we support parliaments to be genuinely independent? How can we help to enhance democracy across the Commonwealth and, dare I say, beyond the Commonwealth, because there are some global challenges around rising authoritarianism and threats to uh, democratic norms? So I want to finish by encouraging uh, either as individuals um, or as branches members of the CPA to respond to this consultation, because it will help us ensure that we have a strategy that is as effective as possible to move our organization together to forward together and to make sure that we as the CPA secretariat are giving every support that we can to branches across all of the different parliaments of the Commonwealth. Because it is clear from the discussion today and from what we all know that the situation varies enormously between parliaments in terms of the levels of resources available, in terms of trust with their public, in terms of issues of autonomy and independence. Let us work together to ensure that we can learn from the best. And I'm really pleased that we've heard such great examples, I think, today um, from our friends in, in Assam and Western Australia and the Maldives. And I look forward to working with all of you as we take these challenges forward in the months ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, and on that note, I'd, I'd just like to again extend my apologies for the earlier technical issues. Uh, I think in spite of them, we still managed to have, uh, as, as Stephen said, a very robust discussion, a very informed discussion, and a lot of... Thank you. I think we've lost James. So um, if I if I might just say, without something like that was bound to happen, wasn't it? Just to reinforce what he was saying, um, thank you to everyone for participating uh, today. Matt, I don't know if you want to say anything by way of any uh, final closing remarks. Uh, no, thank you, Stephen. Uh, just very briefly that uh, this work, uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available to uh, other parliamentarians, other speakers across the Commonwealth. We're also planning on having a, a follow up webinar with other speakers, presiding officers from other jurisdictions uh, across the Commonwealth.
which is a different time zone. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to take some of the, the thoughts and outcomes from this uh, webinar and feed them into those uh, for the future. So thank you very much. Stephen, could, yes, I, could I just say something? The one thing I didn't mention was that one of the reasons we were able to achieve so much during this time is because of our fabulous parliamentary staff that we have, yeah. who have really ridden, uh, you know, risen to the cause, taken on all the additional hours just as we have, and have just been superb. So, you know, I just want to acknowledge the contribution they have made to assisting us through this time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, thank, you, thank, you. Kate. thank you. Bye. Thank you. I think we all echo that, those words, and we should never forget the amazing. No, they just all around me now. Thanks Thank very you. much, okay. everyone. Thank okay. you for everyone Thank who's you. participated today. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good good day or evening. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.